to begin. Now, Jonathan needs no introduction for those who are in FASS because you have already met him in some other module. I was told it's GE. GE, yes. Yeah. And he's a co author of this book, Buying Time for Climate Change. So he's coming to tell us how to buy time for climate change today. <laughs> Let's welcome him to this uh, talk today. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. Okay. For those who know me, uh, let me start with the traditional uh, introduction. Uh. Hello! <laughs> yes, and welcome! Uh. So to, this is a guest lecture. I'm going to talk about addressing climate and sustainability issues in a complex world. Now, uh, I don't promise to have answers or solutions, uh, but at the very least, uh, I think I want to raise up some issues that, that we usually tend to overlook when it comes to addressing this kind of uh, climate and sustainability issues. Uh, okay? Now, some background. I know some of you are very surprised to see me here because like, why is my GET uh, prof uh, teaching this? Yeah? Because I, I happen to, to, be, to, to work on this book on climate change, but some background just so you know, uh, yeah? uh, especially those who are not from FASS. So, uh, my background, I am a philosopher by training. Uh, I teach philosophy of computing, philosophy of data analysis. I also teach classical Chinese philosophy. Yeah? Now, Prior to coming to NUS, I was involved, still am, I'm still involved in this uh, research centre, it's called Paralimus. They used to be here in Singapore for about 10 years, now they've, they've moved back to the Netherlands, right? So this centre was started by several Nobel laureates. They got together and said, we need a research centre that's dedicated on multidisciplinary uh, research. Why? Because the Nobel laureates, they realised that the next big uh, discovery is not going to be found in uh, within one academic silo, not, not within one academic discipline. It's going to be found at the interface of industry, academia, and government. So uh, my involvement with this research centre allowed me to work with a lot of policy makers, people in government, uh, academics, uh, and also people from corporations. Uh. So, so it was very, very eye-opening. And uh, we one of the most recent projects that we work on is this, uh, Buy Time for Climate Action, uh, where we brought together not just academics, uh, but people, policy makers as well, uh, people from think tanks and all that, who are actually involved in trying to fix the climate problem. Yeah. So, uh, and one of the things, and I found this project quite eye-opening because we tend to overlook a lot of issues. And uh, just to get us aware of the kinds of issues that we tend to overlook, uh, I have a discussion for us to start out with. Yeah. Um, basically, I want to talk about two case studies. Yeah. So now. Let's consider case study one. Uh. Imagine that we have a mining town. Uh, so what do I mean by mining town? Like, like, okay, Singapore is too small to have this. Uh, but in other countries, the, they, they, there will be specifically towns, right? Where everyone living in the town, yeah, their father, their grandfather, uh, all their relatives, uh, they all live there because they're dedicated to mining. So let's imagine that there is a coal mine, okay? So this town is dedicated to mining coal. Uh, they've done this for many decades, right? And it's, of course, it's creating a lot of environment, uh, environmental destruction, uh, right? What would the solution be if we want to solve the environmental problem? Off the top of our heads, what comes to mind? Shut down the coal mine? Stop the mining activities? Create alternative jobs. For the Create mine. alternative jobs, okay. Yeah, so, let, so let's just KIB this, but, but you, usually, what would the, the climate um, activists usually say? Shut down the coal mines, right? That's, that's usually the, the answer, that, the, the, the thing that they'll, they'll, be, they'll be saying, right? Now, consider this other thing, huh? case study two, all right? Plastic cups, plastic straws. And of course, you all, you all know plastic straws, right? The, the famous turtle or puppies with the straw in the nose, right? Yeah? So, imagine that now we've reached a point where we discover that recycling all these plastic cups and plastic straws is not economical at all. Right, it's actually cheaper to just incinerate or just bury it somewhere. Yeah. So of course, uh, what 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 do you think will be the the, the best way to solve this uh, environmental problem? Just just ban straws, ban cups, right? So I have some discussion questions. Okay, uh, for for us to consider. Yeah, which is basically. Uh, we, we always think about the solution, like we say close down the coal mine or we say ban the plastic cups and plastic straws, right? Now I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the people who are affected by these kinds of decisions, okay? Discuss with your group and uh, type out your answers in the Google Docs. Come, let's go. Okay, everyone, come, come, let's, let's discuss this together. Huh? Okay. Yeah. All right, so everyone, hello, hello. Okay, so what have we discovered from, from this discussion? Huh? That actually, if you want to bring about change, there's a lot of uh, obstacles along the way, right? Um, I know many of you said mindsets. What, what else? Uh, 
become obstacles for, for this kind of progress. Mindsets, then uh, uh, culture. Maybe? Culture is also also an issue, right? Yeah, like like let's say, what, what kind of culture are you are you thinking of? Um, I think in regards to the first situation, the miners have yeah. the culture. Of- being yeah, it's, it's, it's their identity, right? It's culture and identity to take it away from them. It's like, you know, like, like for example, Singaporeans, then, then, then we take away something very Singaporean from our culture. We would be very upset too, yeah? So so culture is that. Um, there's politics also, right? Yeah? How about legislation? Legislation also, right? If, if I want to let you use a reusable card, but, but if you get food poisoning, I, I am open to being sued, correct? So would I let you use your reusable cup? Actually, no. And, and this is happening right now. This is happening right now. I know, I know, I, I, I know someone who, who recently bought a tumbler, uh, okay? Just so uh, she can use it for bubble tea shops. You know, it's like, okay, I'll be environmentally friendly, right? Then she brought it to the bubble tea shop. They say, sorry, no, we cannot uh, uh, put bubble tea in, the, in this tumbler that you brought. Then they ask why, of oh, food safety regulations. Ah, it's number one. Yeah. So, what is the learning point? Huh? When it comes to a lot of all this environmental uh, action, okay, a lot of the prescriptions that we tend to hear, a lot of the things, you know, people say that oh, we are trying to change the world. Yeah? Politicians are saying we are trying to change the world. But there's so much frustration because nothing seems to be happening. And why is it that nothing is happening? It's because we tend to get stuck in linear thinking. We think that, okay, if the problem is the coal mine that's causing all the environmental problem, then what do we do? Then we just shut down the coal mine. Lah. Right? If plastic cups and plastic straws are affecting the environment, then we ban plastic cups and plastic straws, right? Very linear. Actually, we, we, we fall prey to this thinking, not, not just for environmental issues, like, even for ourselves, right? Like, what to do in the future? Oh, if, my cap is, if I can get my cap to be a certain level, then I can get a, a high-paying job. Then I can buy a house, get married, have kids, or whatever, right? We tend to fall into this trap of linear thinking, yeah? And the, the moral of the story is this, uh, climate change and any other social issue is what we call complex issue. Yeah? It's not linear. We cannot think in a linear way. The moment we think in a linear way, once we execute, we're going to find many obstacles, many roadblocks. Yeah? Now, I want to introduce you to this concept. It's called complex adaptive systems. Have, have any of you heard of this term before? No? Yeah. So, what is a complex adaptive system? Basically, you and I, the, the school, the society we live in is, is a complex adaptive system, right? Let's just say that that's you, right? You will respond, you will change your behavior when the environment changes, right? If let's say bubble tea goes on discount, half price, what, what's going to happen? You all will go and buy bubble tea, right? If Wakao is having a promo, you all will also go for Wakao, right? If, if, uh, if, so, so basically, we change our behavior according to the environment, according to society. We also change our behavior when other people, other organizations, change their behavior as well, right? We're constantly adapting, yeah? And what happens in this huge complex system of the world, or even of, or just society itself, is that the reason why none of us can make, very, very few of us are successful in making uh, progress for all this climate stuff is because we get trapped in a deadlock, yeah? Because we adapt together with the system. It's just like, for those of you who use iPhones, right? What, what do you notice? You buy an iPhone, then you start to buy all the iPhone accessories, all the dongles and the cables. And what have you just done? You have locked yourself into the system, right? It's very difficult to, it's very costly to move out of the Apple ecosystem, correct? Similarly, to solve any environmental problem, okay, a lot of what we have today is locked into the system. Yeah, Sure, mining is a problem, but we can't just uh, close down the coal mines, right? Because livelihoods are at stake. People need, a, or need an alternative, correct? Yeah. So we need to be aware that these deadlocks exist because we have co-evolved and adapted with the system. Yeah. Now, in, in the book, uh, hey, do you, where's the book? Oh, your text. Uh, okay, yeah. In, in, in this book, <laughs> Buying Time for Climate Action, right? Uh, what we did was, was we, we had discussions with many of these experts, policy makers, practitioners, people who are actually trying to stop, uh, uh, or rather people who are trying to make the world better, right? Uh, and, and we've discovered that there's essentially five stumbling blocks to progress. And what are these five? Finance or the lack of incentives, that's the first one. Another one is bureaucracy, institutional resistance. Yeah. Third one is vested interests and mindsets. Fourth one is lack of political will and support. And the fifth one is lack of talent. Notice in the discussions that we had earlier, all this came up, right? Yeah. If I have no incentive to, 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 to change jobs or whatever, I, I wouldn't want to change, right? Uh, 
why would I let you use a recyclable card if I, I'm open to being sued, right? Yeah. Or vested interest and mindsets. Yeah? We have a certain mindset, oh, I don't want to wash a cup or whatever, right? So political will and support. If I if I do something that is good for the environment but but makes my, my electorate unhappy, what's gonna happen? Y'all are gonna vote me out, correct? Yeah? And lack of talent. Where can we find people who are brave enough to stand up against the, the crowds? Where can we find people who are creative enough to overcome all these stumbling blocks? Now the, the thing that we found about these five stumbling blocks is many a times we've made no progress because the people who are too busy trying to make the world better are stuck in these rabbit holes. It's very easy to get dragged down into any one of these five rabbit holes. Yeah. So, uh, but, but let, let me just elaborate. Huh? Uh, a good example is this, the COP26 that happened this year, at the start of this year, right? Uh, such a huge disappointment, right? What was the, the, the huge problem? What made all the environmentalists so upset? The, the climate goal was, uh, they, instead of phasing, phasing out coal, they refined it to phasing down. Yeah? Of course they were very upset because, oh, there's still all these coal, mine, coal mining activities, still bad for the environment. But they don't realize we can't phase out because how many countries the economies will be impacted, right? And, and think also, uh, not just the coal mining industry, we have a lot of industries that are tied to coal mining. So if coal mining is affected, many other uh, industries are affected. Yeah? So it's not just simply uh, we stop this, everything is okay. We stop this, the world will get messier. Things will get even more expensive to produce. Yeah? So let me just elaborate a little bit more about finance and lack of incentives. This, this is very eye-opening. Uh, so let's think about this. What The first lack of incentive is this, that the cost of being sustainable tends to be more than the cost of being unsustainable. I'll give you an example. You know in the food courts and the hawker centers, right? There's actually a dishwashing fee that the hawker store owners have to pay a dishwashing fee. For every plate, there is a fee, right? Now, if I'm selling like five, four or five dollar bowl of noodles or rice, as a hawker seller, I don't mind paying the fee, correct? But what if I'm selling economy bihun, two dollars? Oh, then the pinch is very high, correct? Will I be inclined to, to, to pay the dishwashing fee? No, right? So, so what then is the, the cheaper alternative? I would then use disposables. That's why you notice if you go food court and hawker center, who, when, when many stores are using uh, uh, reusable plates, right? Economy Bihun tends to use styrofoam, right? Ah. Place the paper on the, on the plate. Oh, some of them do that, is it? Ah, okay, okay. But, but ma many places actually they, they just use disposables straight away. Yeah? Sometimes even you need to hire one person to just wash dishes, manpower costs. You know how much you pay dishwasher? About three to four thousand dollars because very few people want to spend their lives washing dishes. <laughs> yeah, three to four thousand dollars. If I sell bubble tea, you 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 think I can? How much profit I can make if I pay people three three four thousand dollars a month, right? So the cost of being sustainable is right now still we haven't solved this problem, and to to push sustainable solutions, it's not going to work all the time. Yeah. So now, the to to elaborate on bureaucracy, right? Institutional resistance. What what do we have? I have this very good example, which is very relatable. Do you know a few years ago, NUS actually banned straws on campus? Were, were you around? In, in those days? That was in 2018. Four years ago, I don't think they were here. Were you all around? Yes. Yeah? So, well, well, four years ago, NUS banned straws, okay? Banned plastic straws. And it turns out there was a huge backlash, okay? There are people are like, oh, banned. Vocal NUS students protest plastic straw. At first, I, I, I saw this on Reddit and Facebook and I thought, why, why are students complaining about all this uh, straw banning, right? So, actually, it's not that, 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 that the students are entitled or what. It, you, you know what was the problem? Like the FASS can, arts canteen, right? Okay, you, like for example, the food juice store. The auntie, you, you say like, uh, auntie, I want apple yakko, right? Then, then they should give you the drink. She'll still seal the drink, right? And then she'll just give you like that. There's no straw. So, so there was no way to drink the drink. So, so when the, the moment they banned straws, they only banned straws, but they didn't change anything else. So students were so upset because they were given uh, like that, the auntie saying like that, then how to drink, how to drink. So, so eventually the auntie, not, not just the food juice store, the, the kopi store also, right? What they do? They bring their own knife, uh, then, then uh, poke like that. <laughs> poke. Then you expected to drink from, from one, one small little hole in the plastic, right? Very upsetting, right? Of course, can you tell them, auntie, don't, don't, don't seal the thing? No. This is where bureaucracy comes in. Because it has become SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. 
right? Why? For food re safety regulation. So many drink stores are required to seal the drink to guarantee food safety. Ah. So it's one thing to ban the straws, right? But then you ban the straws and then now the consumers have this problem like, how the hell am I supposed to drink from this? <laughs> <laughs> and and what's, what's the, the, the obstacle? The SOP. Because people don't want to get sued for food poisoning. Yeah? We also had the same problem when uh, years ago, uh, I think about 10 years ago, uh, when Bread Talks first got, got popular, right? then people were saying, oh, there's so much food wastage. So one guy decided to go around all the Bread Talk outlets, collect all the leftover breads to give to charity. Then what happened? Food poisoning. Uh, so some of the charities, they, they eat the bread, they get food poisoning. Then it, then it gets sued, right? So these problems come into play, all right? And, and we need to be aware that sometimes we want to change, but we need to be aware of the bureaucracy that is forming the obstacle. Okay, now, let's talk about vested interests and fixed mindsets, yeah? Uh, we, we already got a sense of that just now, right? If I am a stakeholder in a mining company, will I want the mining company to be shut down? Of course not, right? So what will allow me to... To, to embrace a change. If you can give me a better alternative, right or not? If you say, okay, you, we close down the mining company, we close down this coal mine, but we open something else that will make as much money. Then sure, as a stakeholder, I don't mind, right? But this is not happening right now. But the other problem is, as, as this group mentioned, culture, right? Culture and mindset is a huge thing. Yeah? Uh, and, and this happened uh, a few years ago in Australia. Yeah? Actually, it happened in Singapore too, but I couldn't find a news article about it. So, a few years ago, what happened? Uh, they tried to stop selling, uh, they, they started charging for plastic bags. Yeah? Then what happened? Uh, in Australia, they have a term for it, it's called bag rage. Yeah? So on certain days, they will start to charge 10 cents, 20 cents for plastic bags, and then people are like, huh, I have to pay. Then what they do? They bag rage, uh, they, they, they get abusive to the, the supermarket staff. Right? This actually happened in Singapore, but I can't find the article. So all I have here are Australian articles. Uh. Singapore also same thing. They keep trying year after year, in the past 10 years, they take away plastic bags, then all the uncle, auntie do their grocery shopping angry. Then they scold the NTUC staff, the cold storage staff. Then after a while, the plastic bags came back again. Right? So culture is very hard to change. Yeah? Uh, now, of course, I guess we've, we're slowly changing the culture in Singapore. We're starting to get a bit more accepting, right? But we need to be aware that you cannot just take away, right? We need alternatives, yeah? Now, one problem also with vested interests is this. It's called greenwashing. Have you heard of this term? Greenwashing, yeah? It's a kind of marketing or PR that gives the company the, the public perception that they are trying to be sustainable, environmental. Huh? Uh, I, I leave you to Google this word to, to, to learn more. Lah. But basically, there's a lot of companies claiming to be green. Now they say, okay, for every dollar spent on this, we are going to plant a tree. But if you actually track down what they're doing, they are paying another company who promises to plant a tree. So are they actually planting the trees? No, they're paying someone who promises to plant a tree. Yeah, That's the difference. Huh? But because they're pouring money into it, what happens? They can therefore claim they're being environmental. Yeah. The other issue is recycling. Lah. Recycling is not as cost effective as we think. And... If you actually Google this and, and read up more, recycling actually was a campaign started by the big oil company. Yeah? Because they didn't want to solve the environmental problem. So they made it the consumer's problem. Yeah? If the, the, there's pollution because of plastic waste, that's on you for not putting it in the bin properly. Yeah? So, so because of years of this uh, recycling campaign started by the big oil companies, now we have this idea, yeah, as long as I recycle, I'm doing my part for the environment. But you've, you've read, right, how a lot of recycled stuff are not recycled, right? They, what, what happened to it? It gets sent to China, gets sent to Malaysia, and it's just dumb there because no one knows how to effectively recycle all these things. Yeah? So we, we cannot, uh, we, we need to be aware that recycling actually do doesn't solve a lot of problems. It makes us feel like we are doing something. Of course, there's lack of political will and support. And uh, what's the issue? When I met some policymakers from the UK and the US, and one of the interesting things they say is, you know, we from the West, we have a certain uh, envy of uh, Asian governments. Yeah, what, and what, what's the envy? Like Singapore, like China, our, the, 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 it's the same ruling party for many, many years, right? And because it's the same ruling party for many years, these governments can do very long-term planning, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, right? America, UK, how, how frequent are the elections? Four, two, four. Two, two to four years, right? 
if you so what what does this mean it changes what you can plan right because you need to keep your electorate happy to stay in power yeah a lot of things that is good for the environment okay will make people unhappy for the short term but will make us better in the long term but the long term outlives their election cycles so what happens many politicians in the west much as they, they they might be interested in solving climate issues they have a uh, more immediate problem how do i win elections so unfortunately that overrides the long-term kinds of problems that they need to solve yeah and of course i mentioned a uh, lack of talent how often do you come across politicians or people who are willing to face up to angry crowds and say no we cannot do this no we need to change yeah it is very hard to find this kind this kind of uh, people so all when we combine all this together we start to realize wow trying to change the world trying to fix all these climate issues is not so straightforward anymore right there's so much resistance everywhere we look people will be unsupportive even though we know that ultimately it is good for us yeah scary right so but the thing is this up uh, as long as we we try to tackle any of this head on it's very easy to fall into the rabbit hole yeah so what is the solution ah but before i get to the solution let me say a word about human behavior okay because human behavior is very weird okay uh we don't behave as ideally as we like to behave okay i know I, I give you an interesting example sometime in 2016 uh, uh the eu was actually having this huge debate okay they said we have one billion dollars okay should we spend one billion dollars on uh, hiv medical research or should we spend that one billion dollars on research on how to change the culture about uh, uh about uh, hiv now why is this a very important question for the eu because they uh, they did the they did the research right when hiv rates are very high what happens then promiscuity is very low people are like oh the hiv everywhere we 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 play safe then when the hiv rates go down what happens ah uh, people take start to take on more risky behavior like okay okay you know, hiv is not an issue now right it's it's like covid also lah right now we don't hear covid okay we're very very relaxed then when we start to hear more and more people getting infected so like, okay maybe i wear a mask right this behavior comes into play yeah when we when we know the risk is uh of of being affected is very high we become uh more reserved right when 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 the risk is very low ah more relaxed right more complacent the same can be said also about cholesterol yeah uh public health research they struggle with this like people with high cholesterol right so so they test okay i have high cholesterol then what 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 do they do okay i'm going to live a good lifestyle eat healthier and and all that right then they go for the next cholesterol test the doctor says ah good news your cholesterol levels are now okay what do you think the person is going to do after that <laughs> go back to chat kway teow yeah go back to chat kway teow go back to everything yeah huh? this is human nature our doctors know this our government knows this and we're still trying to research how to solve this problem this this is at the forefront of my mind because my friend actually was was watching his cholesterol level so he walk every day he eat he healthy every day then then he he recently had a test okay so now 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 that he boom big gain very very quick he eat all the junk and everything yeah now this is just public health ah huh? is our own bodies right You, what do you think we're going to do if we have come up with more sustainable and environmentally friendly solutions if we are able to delay climate change by a couple of years what do you think is human behavior going to be use more energy use more energy right now right like 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 the, if we say this building uh all the electricity is supplied by solar power what are you going to do Aircon all the time ah yeah aircon like you, you bring all your batteries your phone your laptop everything you want to charge it and maximize right this is human behavior uh, human nature is like that we're very funny people right <laughs> so so we need to bear this in mind as well because even if we solve all this we, we are going to be more wasteful yeah uh, a good example is this you know when we say that all these tote bags is supposed to be more environmentally friendly right you know why it has backfired and become less environmentally friendly because now tote bags become fast fashion products i mean you think about it if you if you have to buy a reusable bottle i want a uh, Uh, a nice looking one right matches my style correct likewise tote bag i want a tote bag that matches my dressing for each day correct so in instantly this thing that was supposed to solve plastic bags has now become a an environmental problem well done right humanity that's <laughs> simple is it it's a status symbol yeah so now let me 
Add one more point to com further complicate the matter. Have you heard of this term called virtue signaling? Virtue signaling is the act of expressing yourself in a certain way to show that you support a certain political or moral position. Yeah? So, so what some people like to do is they, they, they show, oh, I'm very, I'm very environmentally friendly, so they start to have all these environmental, uh, eco-friendly uh, things lah, to showcase that they are to very environmental conscious, right? Right or not? But you, you know what's the irony? Actually, in order to embrace this kind of lifestyle, you do need to uh, it, you do need to come from a certain level of privilege as well, because these things are not cheap. Yeah, to maintain all these things is not cheap. How 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 much time do you have to wash all these things every day? Right. Yeah. So we we need to bear bear this in mind, and also ah. Uh, as part of the whole virtue signaling, because right now we have a lot of products in the market, right? They're saying, oh, you know what? We have biodegradable plastics. Ah, so, so, so you can use all these biodegradable plastics and it's good for the environment. But, but you know what's the irony? Biodegradable plastics actually doesn't solve the plastic crisis. There's actually a little star star at the bottom of biodegradable plastics. Did you know that biodegradable plastics, okay, they say it's compostable, right? But they are, they can only be compostable in an industrial composting facility. That is the star star. So if you buy ordinary biodegradable plastics and you throw it away regularly or you bury it or you, or you do your normal composting, it will still behave like regular plastics. So a lot of this eco-friendly stuff, right, that claims to be environmentally friendly is actually not environmentally friendly. It is part of the whole greenwashing, virtue signaling stuff that's going on. Yeah? And if you're not careful, and if we buy into this mindset, what are we doing? We're reaffirming the consumerist culture, right? I, I just buy more of this, it's going to somehow degrade, uh, self, self decompose on, on its own, it's supposed to be better for the environment. That is perpetuating the con, uh, con consumer mindset, right? So we need to be careful on that. Yeah? So, end of the day, uh, when we're thinking of how to devise solutions, we must be aware. Don't fall prey to linear thinking solutions, okay? And recognize that we are actually living in an adaptive system that so many factors co-adapt, co-evolve together with us into where we are today, yeah? Now, if we don't, if I say don't, don't, don't deal with the rabbit hole, uh, uh, the five stumbling blocks head on, right? So what can we do to overcome it? Interestingly, the solution that the experts came up with is to just look around it. Don't avoid uh, avoid confronting them head on. Yeah, I give you a very good example. It's a very fun example by by, by Department of Economics and PUB. Okay, um, you you know what they did uh, as an experiment to reduce uh, water consumption? They started this thing called the Smart Shower Program. Have, do you have this in your homes? Any of you? Okay. Do you have? Let me see it. This 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 meter in in your shower. No. Uh. Now I tell you what's interesting, right? So. They have this thing um, where, okay, so they did an experiment where they have different meters, okay? One of it showed how much money you're going to use when you shower. Do you think that works? Actually, no. How much do you think a shower costs? A typical shower is about 20 liters. It's less than a dollar. A typical shower is less than a dollar, but you touch how many household members, that's how many days in a month, it comes up to a lot, right? But if you, let's say you, you work very hard that day, and you see the meter, 850 cents only. Uh, I yeah, can la, I can shower for one dollar more. So, so it produces the opposite result, right? So you know what PUB and Department of Econs found? You notice there's a polar bear here, right? Yeah? If you shower too long, the polar bear dies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? You shower too long, the polar bear dies. <laughs> and, and, and it succeeded in reducing five liters of water, uh, water consumption per shower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That works, right? But this is a good example of what I mean by you don't address the problem, the, the stumbling blocks hit on, right? You know this? Oh, no, you shower, oh, very sure, very sure. Oh, the polar bear is dying. Oh, okay, I stop, I stop. That has better better effect. Now, of course, do you, how, how, how successful do you think this program is? You can apply for one, you know. Are you going to, would you, any of you apply for it? Uh, to, to, to have this installed in your house. Free of yeah, it's free. <laughs> okay, so let's say it's free of charge. Would you would you install this? Yes. You would? Why, why wouldn't you? 
<laughs> you, you want to shower in peace, right? You don't want to shower and the polar bear yeah. die on you while you're showering, right? <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but interesting, isn't it interesting that, that once we avoid uh, addressing the issue head on and we start to be creative, we, we, we actually have something that almost works, lah, almost works. It doesn't work all effectively, lah, but it, it was quite effective in reducing water consumption by 5 liters per shower. Huh? Interesting, yeah? So, now, we also need to bear in mind, whatever solutions that we have, if we need to get rid of it, we need to provide a better alternative. Okay, if it's worse, people will always revert back to the, the old ways, yeah? Otherwise, more deadlock, yeah? And, now, this is important. We need to recognize that there's no one-size-fits-all solution to the problem. Part of the whole uh, virtue signaling uh, industry, yeah? all, all these biodegradable plastics, is the idea that, um, oh, here is a plastic that is going to save the world. But they don't realize that the, 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 the star star is what? It needs an industrial composter to uh, degrade it, right? In the bigger scheme of things, one of the reasons why a lot of governments are not effective is because they try to do a one-size-fits-all picture on the whole country, yeah? And we all have different needs, different users, different purposes, right? So a one size fits all picture has proven to fail. So what is the solution? Now, one of the guys in the book is, uh, this is uh, Andrew Shen, he's a Malaysian central banker, uh, and, and uh, he's a Time Magazine, 100 most influential people in the world. He has this very uh, flowery language, like he said, let the 10,000 flowers blossom. What, what does he mean by that? Right now, where we are, we don't know what solution works, right? So uh, we, follow, we take an evolutionary uh, approach to this, right? We try many, as many ways as possible. Don't put all your eggs in one basket and expect this to be the solution. Rather, come up with as many ground-up initiatives. Because why? Government top-down, right? They don't fully understand what's on the ground. But we need to encourage more people on the ground to come up with solutions that works better for them. And when we encourage more and more ground up solutions, then it'll be, we have more effective solutions that better address smaller groups, rather than one big top down to try to address everyone to, at the same time. That's what it means. Lah. Okay, so I've talked too much already. Now it's time for Q&A.